Let's talk about the kingdom of God today because Jesus always did. The kingdom of God, the Malchut Shamayim, as the Hebrews call it, the kingdom of the heavens, the kingdom of God. Jesus was a kingdom of God person. So I want to leave you, if you have a pencil to take down some of these verses, with a nice Bible study you can do with your friends across the coffee table, uh, basically around the eight kingdom verses in the book of Acts. So you'll hear, one of my themes is that you are the kingdom. Not only are you going to be in the kingdom, but you are the kingdom. That's a high privilege, isn't it? Look at the fuss over the election we've just had. Everybody wants to know, who's going to be in this position of the cabinet? Who's going to do what? And I'm saying, you are the kingdom of God in training. You are the royal family in training. Correct me if I'm wrong. Don't I believe a word I say. Check the preacher always. But you are the kingdom of God. That's a high privilege, isn't it? God in his mercy looks at you and he says, I could use this person in a government that's going to work. So he's watching us with his x-ray eyes and Jesus too, who is searching the hearts and minds. He's doing Yahweh stuff. Jesus is. And he's looking at you. I could use this person to rule the world effectively. 1 Corinthians 6, 2, Paul says, in a moment of impatience, my dear friends, he says, you can't fix these little problems in the church. How in the world do you think we're going to govern, Moffat translation gets it right, govern, manage the world? Is that clear to you? That is rather interesting thing to me. You want to be like Jesus? Yeah, I want to be like Jesus. Well, listen to this one. In Revelation 2, I'm going to give you authority over the nations to rule them with the rod of iron. Just as the Father gave it to me. That's being like Jesus, isn't it? What? I never heard that. And I don't hear the Abrahamics doing this very much either. So you get this in the Abrahamic circles now. If I could just hold the door for a thousand years. What? Maybe God is more excited about your talent than you are. So our talents then are to be developed with a view then to fixing this world on a grand scale. I think that's unarguable. Okay, so with that in mind, when you talk to your friends about the gospel, you use the gospel of the kingdom phrase, which you don't hear preached. Have you noticed that? You don't hear that on, on, on Christian radio. The phrase gospel of the kingdom? No, not really. You all know Luke 4.43. I'm sure you do. Luke 4.43, Jesus said, I must preach. I'm duty bound. I'm, I'm driven by God to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the other cities also. That's why God sent me. That's a purpose statement, isn't it? Somebody wrote a book called The Purpose Driven Church. They didn't have a text index. It's always a weakness in a book. He should. Doesn't even mention it. What? Excuse me? Jesus said, preaching the gospel of the kingdom is the reason I was sent. You're the body of Christ. That's the thing it's driving you to. Because Jesus is speaking through you now, isn't he? Same words. The spirit of Jesus is in you. And so you're going to sound like Jesus. Not only what would, Christ, what would Jesus do, you know, the, the band. How about what would Jesus say? Well, he would say what he said when he was here. He's driven by the kingdom. Because his heart is broken by the chaos of the world. So, Luke 4.43, great text. I must preach the gospel of the kingdom to the other cities also. That is why God sent me. That's my commission. That's brilliant. They wanted him to say as their local rabbi, you see, the people liked his preaching. Jesus had a certain authority about him they didn't have in their regular clergy. And so they said, you stay here, Jesus, and be our, our resident rabbi. I said, no, I have to go to the other cities also to preach the gospel about the kingdom, the gospel about the kingdom, vaguely in the Billy Graham circles, the gospel. By that they mean that Jesus died and rose. That's certainly true. But it's not the whole gospel. There's a gospel here that isn't just Jesus died and rose, central as that is. That's, that's the major point, right? Okay, so in the parable of the sower, what is the point there? It's the word of the kingdom, the word of the kingdom, the word of the kingdom. Jesus is sowing the seeds of the word of the kingdom. He's planting the true people of God, the true Israel of God. That's you. You're the result of that seed. And Jesus said, you know, if you don't get that parable right, you don't understand any of them. I like that. My, my wife is a master gardener. I'm very bad in gardening. But I'm in my old age, my dotage, so to speak, I'm beginning to see that seeds are miracles. I put a bean seed in the ground the other day. 
and that little thing comes poking up through the ground. How did that happen? And then it has a white flower. You didn't know a bean had a white flower. I didn't. Maybe you did. From that flower is going to come something edible. That's a miracle. The gospel is, is based on the analogy of, of the natural world around us, isn't it? Seeds. The seed of the gospel of the kingdom has to be sown in your heart. It produces fruit. So if you're the devil, if you were the devil, you'd try to get rid of that gospel of the kingdom. He's done that rather well. It's all about the kingdom. So Luke 4.43, got that one. Now the point would be then, the system which is called dispensationalism, to give it a horrible term, or even ultra-dispensationalism, says Jesus strictly preached to Jews. And that gospel of the kingdom of Jews is not for you. That's a lie. There's a clever half-truth involved there, because Jesus did come only to the house of Israel. You know, he preached while he was here to the Jews first, what we call loosely the Jews. He did preach to them. But then he gave the Great Commission. He said, go into the whole wide world and preach the same message to everybody. Is it clear? Your children need to understand that. They'll never be deceived. OK, so let's do the eight Kingdom of God texts in Acts. Why are we doing the ones in Acts? Because the system out there, dispensationalism or ultra-dispensationalism, says Paul preached a different gospel from Jesus. As one of our favorite friends in the Abrahamics, who is now not well, but his name is Bill Wattell, some of you knew him, he said if Paul preached a different gospel from what Jesus had preached, Paul would put himself under his own curse. Do you get that? Isn't that good? No, Paul was a follower of Jesus. Revealing new things, certainly, you know, talks more about circumcision in the flesh, not being a sin, all that. But he's not changed the gospel. You must get the gospel right. Now, I'm not talking boring doctrines here. I'm talking about your health and your life, right? The words that I speak to, he said in John 6, 63, the words that I speak to are spirit and life. So if you're lacking spirit and life, more of the words of Jesus is going to re remedy that. So that's the basic idea that we've come to. And we've come to this, I think, gradually. You don't learn all this initially, but this seems to be the way it is. So that awful word doctrine, which only means teaching, is everything. Everything Jesus said was doctrine. Doctrine is only teaching, but we're being manipulated by false words a lot of the time. The words you use, use you. OK, so let's do the eight kingdom texts in Acts, the point being, that in Acts, we know what Paul was preaching as gospel. And he hasn't changed the kingdom message a, a bit. So you've got eight kingdom texts ready to go with your friends at every point. And in America, you can talk about the Bible without being regarded as a fanatic. You can. You can say at the checkout counter, isn't it great? The kingdom is coming. And, and they're not going to dismiss you as some American fanatic, especially in the South. <laughs> so we do it all the time. Here they go. Eight kingdom texts in Acts. They go like this. 1, 3, 1, 6, 8, 12. I'll do them slowly in a moment. 1, 3, 1, 6, 8, 12, 14, 22, 19, 8, 20, 24, and 25. That's chapter 20, 24, and 25. And then the 28th chapter, our brother Luke, who wrote more of the New Testament than anybody else. Slightly more. Including the whole book of Acts and the whole book of Luke. Isn't that amazing? God can do that. Not everybody has written most of the Bible or the New Testament, but Luke did. Going to meet him one day. Okay, so here they go. 1 3. What does 1 3 say? I'll refer to, the, to these verses. We don't necessarily turn and read them, it may not be time. But Acts 1 3. Jesus has come back from death. How do I know that? How did Peter knew, know that Jesus had come back from death? You know what he said? We had breakfast with Jesus the other day after he came back from death. How do I know Dan's alive? I saw him. How do I know Sharon's alive? I had breakfast with Sharon this morning. That's it. You don't need a PhD to argue any of that. This is simple, down-to-earth, beautiful truth about coming to life after being dead. That's wonderful. So Acts 1-3, I will read that one. Acts 1-3 goes like this. You can read any translation. NIV is rather Trinitarian. It's okay. NASU is very nice. King James is difficult to read. Don't recommend that necessarily, but Acts 1.3, you have this. To these apostles, he presented himself alive 
after his suffering. Isn't that great? Here I am, it's me, I'm alive. You saw me die, now I'm alive. Do we need to argue that? You need PhD degrees in that? No, no, of course not. Our children understand that. Okay, present him alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, this is Acts 1-3, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, about six weeks. Six week period. And what was he talking about? Speaking to them about the KG, wasn't he? You can't argue with that. Jesus, I want to tell you, was obsessed with the kingdom. You should be too. He's obsessed with the kingdom because he knows, he knows there's going to be peace on earth, prosperity, a world like you ain't seen, as my Georgian coming out again. You ain't seen nothing yet. Your faces are going to shine like the sun in its strength. You're a good looking crowd now, you say to your audiences, but you ain't seen nothing yet, right? When you are a glorified human being, your face is going to shine like the sun in its strength. You're going to live forever. How about that? So Jesus has the cure for death, tell your friends. We get very excited about someone's got a cure for this or that disease, maybe. How about a cure for death? In school, we learned that William Wilberforce abolished slavery. We thought that was rather cool. It is cool to abolish slavery. 2 Timothy 1.10 says that Jesus, in the gospel, came to abolish death. He has a cure for death. Isn't that interesting? That, to me, is very fascinating. I didn't hear this in church. Had to come all the way to the States to hear it. Okay, so that's Acts 1.3. You've got 1.3. Eight kingdom texts in Acts to show that Paul is still preaching the gospel of the kingdom just as Jesus had. 1.3. Now 1.6. At my site, uh, which is uh, focused on the kingdom or restorationfellowship.org, I wrote an article that was published many years ago. Acts 1.6 goes like this. When they had come together, at the end of 40 years, uh, 40 days, I should say, of kingdom preaching, they were asking him, saying, Kyrie, Lord, Lord Messiah. They addressed him as Lord, Master. Has the time now come for you to restore the kingdom to Israel? To me, that's the right question, isn't it? These are Jesus' students who, after all that training, they say, Has the time come? We can't wait for this, Lord, to restore the kingdom to Israel? which is the whole biblical story, and you are the Israel of God, and there's also a future for ethnic Israel as well. It's another subject, but is it time for the kingdom? And he says, it's not for you to know the stretches of time. He didn't know himself. Only the Father knows that. Okay, so isn't that fascinating? Tell your friends this. Talk about these things with your friends a lot. That's the right question. If you say it's the wrong question, you're, you're attacking Jesus' students. You see how bad that is? But believe me, Calvin said, that is just wrong, wrong, wrong. The kingdom of Israel, all that political stuff, it's all wrong. It's absolutely right, because that's what they'd learn. And you're going to throw in, always in your conversation, Luke chapter 19. That's a great place to start with people. Luke 19 is the parable of the nobleman. They were standing close to Jerusalem, Jesus was, and they thought the time had come for the king. That was right. They weren't wrong. You know, you're standing next to London and you're the queen. It might be that you're going to rule in London. So in Nicaragua, where we were uh, only two weeks ago, I said to, in, I spoke in three universities and two radio stations. I said, if I tell you that Prince Charles is heir to the throne of England, he's going to sit on the throne of England and rule over England, are you going to pull in the PhDs to try to, to understand what I said? Of course not. However, if I say to you, Jesus is going to get the throne of his father David, the throne of his father David and rule over Israel forever, and the, rule over the world forever, that's chaos. Acts 1, 3, 1, 6. Is this the time to restore the kingdom? At our side, an article, something about Acts 1, 6 and the restoration of the kingdom of Israel. What I showed was that commentators went crazy with this word. Those poor disciples, how stupid they are. And I'm saying, wait a minute, that was a great question. But when they believed Philip, as he was preaching the gospel about the kingdom of God and the things uh, about the name of Christ, they were getting baptized men and women. Let's argue about it, let's not. These, these are non-negotiable things, folks. Isn't that beautiful? They're sitting there, Philip the evangelist is going on about the kingdom with them. 
and they're, these are just ordinary regular folk and they're saying, I get it. Then they're ready to be baptized in water, of course. And now a huge argument about and it's absolutely unnecessary. And let's not argue about baptism. You do it because Jesus said you do it. And obedience and salvation go together. The obedience of faith, framing the book of Romans, the obedience of faith, the obedience of faith. And Hebrews 5, 9, a text to be used all the time, says that salvation is given to those who obey Jesus. Wow. Is that difficult? So if we shake our fists at Jesus and say, I'm not going to do it because I, I, you know, my guru taught me, that. well, we're in trouble. So that's beautiful. We're lining up to get baptized, which was the answer of a good conscience before God. Peter actually says that baptism saves, not the water on your skin, but the answer of a good conscience before God. A public statement, like when you get married, you have a ceremony, don't you? That's not wrong. That's beautiful. Okay, so that's Acts 8.12. We've got them. 1, 3, 1, 6, 8, 12. Next one, 14.22. It says, through much tribulation, we're destined to enter the kingdom. None of you have had any tribulation in your life, have you? <laughs> You're smiling. Did Jesus have any tribulation? Yeah, they killed him, right? What does his family think of him? He's mad. Lock him up. Even, I'm going to ask Mary this at the, at the banquet. This is strange. And you bore this child supernaturally and, and you wind up, maybe she had a lapse of clear thinking. I don't know what. But if you're being tribulated, if your own children are opposing you, if your own relatives are saying you're not saved, you're lost, if they're not willing to talk to you, that's part of the course. Through much tribulation, not the great tribulation, that's a future burst of agony just before the second coming, but through much tribulation, Greek word thlipsis, distress, trouble of every type. We are destined to go through that in order to enter the kingdom. Why? Because the Navy SEALs get a rough training, don't they? If you're going to choose the people to rule the world and get immortality, don't you put them through a... Of course you do. And so you, if you're going through tribulation, you put up with it, you bear it, you pray, how long, oh God, you know, is this going to happen? But that's part of what is normal for the Christian life. So that's 1422. 1, 3, 1, 6, 8, 12, 14, 22. Next one. Okay, 19, 8 goes like this. 19, verse 8. Paul entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months. Wow, three months. Reasoning arguing, right, and persuading about what? Kingdom of God. Can you do it? Can you do it? Are you ready? For three months? In some churches they sing, you know, for 50 minutes and preach for five. <laughs> it's exaggerating. You can't do that. Great to sing in church. I love it. But it took Paul several months to argue the kingdom in the synagogue. Can you do it? We say to the students, can you do it? He didn't even have a New Testament there, right? Could you take the Old Testament and argue the kingdom of God for three months? That's an interesting challenge. Okay, next one. We've got 1, 3, 1, 6, 8, 12, 14, 22, 19, 8. Next one coming is 20, chapter 20, verses 24 and 25. This is devastatingly important because it equates the gospel of the grace of God with the gospel of the kingdom. No difference. Devil's major trick is to say, oh, Paul preached the gospel of the grace of God. Jesus preached the kingdom to Jews only. That is false, false, false. It doesn't get any worse than that. So here you have in 2024 that Paul is preaching the gospel of the grace of God. Isn't that beautiful? It's very gracious of God to train you to fix the world and give you immortality as a, as a bonus. How about that? That's a gracious God, isn't it? But in the very next verse, in 25, which is our key kingdom verse, preaching the gospel of the kingdom is the same thing. This is beautiful. Acts 20, verses 24 and 25. The gospel, the grace of God, is the same as the preaching of the kingdom. Heralding the kingdom, by the way. It's a, it's a town crier word. You get a trumpet and you say, the kingdom is coming. It's the only thing that ultimately matters. And, of course, the kingdom is present in the sense that you are the kingdom in training. The spirit of the kingdom is here. You're not shaking your fist at this kingdom message. You have the spirit of the kingdom. That's a down payment. That's a commercial image, right? A down payment 
in view of a much greater amount of spirit at the second coming when you get immortalized. It's an easy program. Okay, so we've got 1, 3, 1, 6, we've got 8, 12, 14, 22, we've got 19, 8, and now we've got 20, this is 24, and 25 is the key verse. How many is that? About six? Six. Two more. Our brother Luke, brilliant teacher as he was, said, let me finish with a flourish. I want them to understand in the last verses of the book of Acts what Paul was doing. Chapter 28, verse 23, when they'd set a date for Paul, they were coming to him at his lodging in large numbers. I wonder how many that was, you know, how many can, people can you get in a, in a lodging? I'm not sure, but they were streaming in to hear Paul talk. And what was he doing? He was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God. That's a very strong term. He's speaking for God. Paul is an apostle. On behalf of God, he says, I'm making a solemn testifying statement for you. You're now responsible for this. You know, remember Jesus said to the Pharisees, if I hadn't come and told you, you wouldn't be guilty. But now I've told you, you're guilty. Isn't that striking? That's, that's interesting to me. If I'm driving, as at one time in Oregon, Illinois, where the Bible college used to be, and the number of the road was 82. If I say to the police, well, I was going 82, but that's what it says I'm not supposed to do. I'm probably guilty anyway. I should know that the speed limit sign is different from the roads. I should know that, shouldn't I? I wouldn't get away with that. But we become responsible for the information we hear. That's why preaching is interesting. As Mark speaks to you week by week by week. These are very solemn occasions, preaching. We don't just get together to go through another sermon, you know. Because we're training to rule the world. That's exciting stuff. Okay, so here it is. Trying to persuade them. Paul was arguing with them. In a nice way. Using all the techniques of persuasion he could manage. Testifying about the kingdom of God and Jesus Christ. From the law, it's from the Old Testament. And uh, from the law of Moses, that is. And from the prophets. Do you know that the book of Revelation is about 450 allusions to the Old Testament prophets? How well do you know the book of Zephaniah? I think so, don't you? Incredible book. Zephaniah? Three chapters. The day of the Lord is at hand, it says. You're a bad crowd now, but you ain't seen nothing yet. That's what they say. See, I, I, my, my sense is that in church, sometimes we don't have enough intensity, enough steam up to really get to be effective. So try to become and, and get the children to become lovers of the prophets of Israel even, who only say two things. They say it's a bad scene now, but wait and see. The kingdom is coming. That's what they say. So Zephaniah, I recommend for your reading, and then Habakkuk and Haggai and the whole, the rest of and Zechariah, rather difficult book, but amazing stuff. Jesus then put all that together in the book of Revelation with about 450 allusions or citations from the prophets of Israel. That's what he's doing. Jesus, in other words, loved the Bible. He loved it. And so you do too, because you're followers of Jesus. Okay, so down at the very end then, I think in verse 25 it says, when they did not agree with one another, the Jewish audience, Jews, some of them agreed, some didn't. And you're not going to convince all your friends. Some of them are just going to say, you heretics, you. You're heretics. They will. They will. And you don't take that badly, you know. Jesus got persecuted too. That's not a big deal. <coughs> so, he quotes Isaiah. They have closed their eyes. This is not Calvinism. People willingly close their eyes. I'm not going to see it. You can argue every argument in the book. I'm not going to see it. I'm not going to see it. That's a sin. And that's 2 Thessalonians 2. Where Paul says, because a passion for truth they did not have in order to be saved. Wait, wait a minute. Paul is an amazing teacher. He didn't say they have a passion for truth or should have a passion for truth in order to be a better Christian. You have to have a passion for truth in order to be saved. Wow. And for that reason, because they didn't have a passion for truth to be saved, God gave them over, Paul says. And the little old ladies in your, in your audience is not going to like this. We don't have little old ladies here, so we'll get away with it. 
it says that God gave them over to a spirit of delusion so they would wind up believing what is false. It sounds to me as though God cares about you believing the truth, doesn't it? I mean, that's powerful stuff. So what happened then? 28, Paul said, Therefore let it be known to you that this salvation of God, this kingdom of God's salvation, believing in Christ and the, and the kingdom to come and all that, has now been sent to the Gentiles. That's an insult to Jews, right? You guys aren't going to listen, he said to the Jews. All right, now I'm going to go to the nations, the Gentiles, those unclean nations. So then, did he change the message? No. Verse 29 says, when he'd spoken these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. Can you see that? They're streaming out there. They're all arguing with each other. And so here we have in 30, and he stayed there for two full years. Two years? What was he doing? Preaching and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Isn't that amazing? For two years? So, you are very blessed to have the kingdom message here. You really are uh, incredibly blessed. So make sure the children get it right, and then they'll head for eternal life. Immortality will come up at the end of time here. Preaching with all openness, unhindered, and thank the Lord for this country. Look at the freedom. If somebody came and tried to stop us from preaching right now, the law would be right here to defend our right of speech. That is a tremendous thing. Do you know why that happened? Because people saw how badly Calvin and others had killed people. They said, never again, let's not do it. And so you have a right of free speech here, unhindered. Nobody's trying to stop us. That might not always go on forever. But right now you have tremendous opportunities to preach these truths and save people for immortality.